Welcome to KSU's Culinary Apprenticeship Information Session. Thanks for joining us. I'm Pat Walker, the Director of Community and Professional Education. As part of my role here at KSU, I get to be part of our Culinary Apprenticeship Program. It's one of the, my favorite things in my position here. On this panel today, I have several people joining us. Instructor Chef Rich Matthews is here with me. Um, I also have one of our current culinary students, Deshaun Johnson is here. Thanks for being here, Deshaun. Um, Andy Long is also with us. He is from one of our culinary apprenticeship sites, Maven Restaurant Group. In registration, our registration team is here. Um, Ryan Capps, the manager of registration, will be part of our conversation this afternoon. And also, uh, Xiao Xiao Ji is here from our pathway advising team. So you'll meet all of them in just a few minutes, but now we'll get started. Our culinary careers. Um, if you are seeking a job in culinary, you can see here the median salary range that's offered, the number of job postings, which is extremely impressive. Um, it's very nice to be able to have that many opportunities um, when you have completed a program such as this. You also will see the food service manager career path, the catering manager and bakery and pastry chef salary ranges that would be available to you if you chose to be a part of a career such as this. I am always really excited about um, our cohorts. We have two that classes that run each year and those groups that have finished in the past have had wonderful opportunities to begin working immediately. Um, chef Rich will tell you this at some point, um, the group that just finished, our class that just finished um, earlier in the year, all but one of our students were offered positions from one of the culinary sites that they were working with. And that particular person that was not offered a position was already working in the field. And so I always appreciate that opportunity. When I graduated from college, I did not have people reaching out to me to offer me jobs. So this is one of the really strong points of a program such as this is we have sites that contact us. We have restaurants in the area that contact us that are really seeking students that they're ready to start employing. So great opportunities are afforded to you by being part of a program such as this. Now, Chef Rich Matthews, as I mentioned just a moment ago, is here with us. Rich, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. I have. Uh worked here at Kennesaw State University since uh, 2017. Prior to that, I was working in South Florida, teaching at the Art Institute, as well as Miami-Dade College. And my career path wasn't directly to food service or food operations. I actually, uh, out of high school, went to college and got a business degree and ended up working in public administration for about 10 years. And figured out relatively quickly that it wasn't really the thing that was lighting up my soul. It wasn't very exciting to me. And it took some time to figure out what that is, as a lot of times we'll face. And uh, I ended up going to culinary school, doing my version of running off to join the circus and turning my life upside down and uh, pursuing something new. Uh, most of my industry work experience has been involved in high volume uh, catering or banquet production, working in hotels. I've worked in some uh, smaller fine dining restaurants as well. Um, <clears throat> but I'd say I've probably been more involved in feeding thousands of people than I have been involved in feeding hundreds uh, for special events like uh, the Kentucky Derby or the Ryder Cup Golf Tournament, the Fort Lauderdale International Boat Show, uh, to mention a few. We are so very lucky to have Chef Rich be a part of our program. So thanks, Jeff Rich. Rich, uh, I think people would love to know about what the course is about and um, give some information, maybe if you would, about the learning assessment methods that um, are part of our class. Sure. So culinary arts and food service in general is an industry uh, where we use our hands, right? We're largely, if you're in the production side of things or in service in some way, we are up on our feet. Uh, creating things with our hands and serving the guests in many different ways. So the program is designed around that idea in mind. It's not the same as, say, like an accounting program where it's more book driven. This is very much uh, built on using uh, teaching techniques and experience techniques that focus on delivering tangible 
things. And that thing is general food that we're producing from this program. So there are some lectures, although as part of class time, it's the smallest piece. Uh, Hands-on demonstrations and discussions, uh, everything that is taught as part of our food production, uh, students are given the opportunity to, to reproduce as part of that. Uh, In-class assessments and quizzes are ways of evaluating that performance. So a quiz is pretty much like we're all familiar with, with a series of questions and multiple choice questions with answers. And the approach I take with the quizzes, which are all delivered online through our digital format, um, really are study aids to the material that's in the book. Uh, the book is, gosh, I think close to a thousand pages and it's not something that we can cover in its entirety in the 22 weeks that we meet in the classroom, uh, the classroom and kitchen. So that's really an opportunity to reinforce that material outside the class. And then the in-class assessments are really stepping back and saying, okay, two weeks ago, we learned how to make hollandaise. Now show me how to make hollandaise. And it's reproducing the, you know, the basic skills that have been taught as part of the course. And then one of the, the key pieces to the way our program is designed, it's taking those in-class lessons and carrying that knowledge, skill, and ability out into the field to, to, to refine it and become better. And it's getting those evaluations back from the apprenticeship side. So it's completing the apprenticeship hours that are part of our program so that you can apply those skills that are being taught in class and do like uh Deshaun has explained and Chef Andy has uh, reinforced, you know, it's getting um, that experience that sets you apart from anybody else walking in off the street. Great, thank you. Will you also review for us um, the needed program information? So the program is designed around 88 classroom hours. We meet face to face uh, or we meet in uh, meet with me uh, 22 times. Uh, one of those is virtually, uh, so that's a hybrid, no cooking class. Uh, as much as as much of the culinary arts is about producing food, there are some things related to say nutrition and food cost and such that are a little bit more theoretical or textbook driven. So that's designed as a, a virtual class. We do meet 21 other weeks, um, and our time is from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. We meet one night a week. Uh, there are some holidays, like when it gets around uh, the end of the year, where we don't meet, and those are programmed into the syllabus from the very beginning. In addition to our one night a week meeting, students also work through the apprenticeship assignments. And those are divided up into six week rotations and you'll work 10 hours a week uh, across four different sites. And those assignments are made by uh, the office here at Continuing Ed. Um, the cost is just shy of $10,000. And as was explained previously, there's payment plans and it's eligible for veterans education benefits as well as loans and scholarships. The course fee will pay for the classroom instruction, your textbooks, and your serve safe training and certification. You get a chef's coat, as well as helping you with the uh, placement for the apprenticeship opportunities, which can turn into employment opportunities long term afterwards. There are some things that a student needs to consider buying additionally. <coughs> uh, that would be your knives, and as somebody who's worked in the kitchen and with maybe a little bit of a fascination with knives, you might find that this can become a, uh, uh, a collection kind of hobby for yourself. Uh, chef pants, and we prefer all of our students to representing the College of Professional Education to wear black chef pants out in the industry. And probably more critical than any other piece of equipment that you could ever have in the kitchen, is going to be a good pair of non-slip shoes. Kitchens are uh, inherently dangerous places to get 
uh, greasy and wet floors, so you need to protect yourself. Not to mention, like I started out saying, you're on your feet, so it's worth spending a couple extra bucks on some good quality shoes that make your feet feel good, or as good as they can possibly after a long day on them. The apprenticeship sites are in the greater Atlanta area. Some of them are closer to Kennesaw, some are in Woodstock. Uh, as Chef Andy mentioned, his restaurants are in Alpharetta. Correct. And uh, so transportation to those various sites is the responsibility of the student as well. There's a couple of other uh, smaller, well, smaller in terms of cost uh, supplies that everyone needs to consider, like an InstaRead thermometer, one of those that you can keep in your pocket to check the temperature for food to make sure it's been cooked thoroughly. And then something to take notes on, like a little pocket pad and pen, because when you're out in the field, there's a whole lot of information coming at you really fast. And it's worthwhile taking 30 seconds to jot down some notes about how something's done or even where to find it in the walk-in refrigerator so that you know. Excellent. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. So now, um, upon completion of this program, what will students have learned and how they can take to their next position, their, their career? So or could you review our learning objectives? Sure. So in no particular order uh, about our learning objectives, there are things that uh, we're aiming for every student who completes the program to walk away with. That first one, though, is going to be professionalism. It wouldn't take long for any of us to think about maybe some TV chefs that have hot tempers and probably use foul language and all those kind of combative things that make for good drama television for reality TV. That may make good television, but it doesn't make for good long-term employment. So uh, we're working on trying to reinforce those things about professionalism, whether it the way we dress and our personal hygiene, because we are taking a certain degree of public trust to the guests when they come through the, the doors of the restaurant to make sure that we're providing them safe food. Beyond that, we want to make sure that our students are able to identify and properly use all the tools and equipment of the kitchen. Uh, safety with our knives is super important, how to handle them, how to pass them on to others, to properly clean and store and sharpen them, being able to apply all the food safety and sanitation guidelines that come from the first few weeks of the course where we focus on the serve safe manager certification, being able to uh, describe and also reproduce the different knife cuts. You do get introduced to a little bit of the French language uh, in this, although uh, we do break it down into good old plain English as well. The French have really taken or gotten credit for the room. A lot of the terminology that we use in the kitchen, so it's making all of our students familiar and comfortable with that. We talk about the importance of how food is presented and how it's done. Um, people eat with their eyes. You'll hear that said over and over. And uh, we want to present that food that they, our guests are paying for in a very attractive, nutritional uh, quality fashion that makes them feel like they're getting their money's worth. And then this, the big, the basic culinary, <coughs> basic cooking techniques on how we prepare types of proteins, vegetables, soups, sauces, and fruit. The, the universe of food is fairly huge and we try to touch a little bit on all of it so everybody walks away from this experience more knowledgeable and hopefully they're prepared to ask good questions out in the field also. Our apprenticeship program, as, as everyone I think knows, is a huge part of our program. So can you give us the details for that? Sure. So the apprenticeship program, which runs parallel with the classroom slash kitchen instruction, is built around completing 240 volunteer hours with a variety of apprenticeship experiences. We have a number of employers uh, that we basically categorize as commercial food service, like a dining hall, um, catering operations, uh, fine dining, and then more casual or family style type concept restaurants. Students will rotate through four different kitchens. They'll spend about six weeks in each of those assignments. And over the course of those six weeks, 
students should become very familiar with the menus and the production needs, what kind of sales volumes those places have, and be able to wrap their head around. And like Deshaun has been able to so effectively demonstrate, prove that he's got the wherewithal um, to be trusted with doing more and more. That works out to about 10 hours a week over 24 weeks. And if you put the math together about how long the instruction piece is, that's 22 weeks, we give everybody two additional weeks after the classroom instruction to work on completing those hours. Now, I will point out that that apprenticeship piece sometimes can be the thing that causes some of the students the most frustration. And I really want to caution everybody to be, maybe not caution, but to be sober to the idea that this is 10 additional hours outside of whatever else is going on in their lives that they need to work towards. Now, we don't hold people to doing 10 hours a week. Sometimes it could be eight, maybe another week it's 12 or 16. It's up to the students to have the discipline to work that out with chefs like Chef Andy and our other apprenticeship partners to make sure that they're getting those hours taken care of. Seasonal changes happen, right? Sometimes it's busier around the holidays. Sometimes it could be slower, depending on the nature of the food service operation. Sometimes people have full-time jobs during the day. Uh, sometimes people are fairly unemployed or working part-time and have more freedom and flexibility in their schedules. Everybody's schedule and circumstance is different, but every student who enrolls in the program has to be really open, uh, open-minded to the to the requirement of completing these hours. It's just super important. I like to say it's the first gate. You don't complete those, you don't pass through towards earning the certificate. And that I think pretty much summarizes what the, the requirements are for the apprenticeship piece. Good, good. Well, requirements I think are something that everyone is always interested in. When you start a new program, you wanna know how do I successfully complete that? Right. Could you go over the grading criteria? Sure. So I mentioned that the apprenticeship hours are the first gate. There is a second gate that if you don't pass through that can also be either the, either the barrier or the, 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 the launch towards success and it has to do with attendance. We meet 22 times. One of those is virtual and attendance also counts for the virtual class. You cannot miss more than four classes. If you missed a fifth class, then that becomes a uh, another gate that's not succeeded and can be and will be the reason for not passing. So that's the first thing that those two pieces is what everybody what everybody needs to know. So attending 80% of the classes, which means not missing more than four sessions, completing 100% of those 240 required work hours. You could do more. Some people do a few more, um, but you cannot do less. You have to attempt and complete the ServeSafe. Uh, ServeSafe Manager is a nationally recognized food safety program from the National Restaurant Association. And as part of the first three weeks of the program, we spend half the class time working through that and then do the, the exam during the third or fourth class, depending on how the schedule is working out. And, um, we want everybody to pass, although passing is not a requirement to move on to the next step. We want everybody to have attempted the ServeSafe exam before they go on to their apprenticeship assignments. Somewhere around week four, people can start working in the field. The, um, <clears throat> you have to complete all of the in-class practical assessments, and those are weighted pretty heavily. If you look down, uh, at the grading criteria on this slide, that's 40%. As a, uh, as a graded item, that's a hefty chunk of the grade. Uh, and that's doing those things that you've already been taught. I mentioned making hollandaise, it's making a soup, it's being able to identify stuff that we talked about, whether it's um, you know, the anatomy uh, of a chicken. Some of the things are practical, like reproduce a recipe. Some things are more descriptive. I like to use the quick question quiz where I'll send out something at the end of the night to everybody's email and ask them to respond. There's no online test for that. It's just answer these two or three questions, send it back to me. Once you've done that, you're free to go for the money. 
classroom participation, the serve safe exam, and then that final cooking practical, each of those count as 20%. And the cooking practical happens on our 22nd class. It's our last face-to-face. -face. And it's, I like to say it's a blind draw or a random selection between two different chicken dishes that we already covered earlier in the program. One is a sauteed chicken breast dish, one is a poached. And then from there, there's a, an assortment of vegetables and starches, and we work together to figure out what that best choice may be, uh, depending on what protein cooking method you, uh, you draw. In this last semester, we drew straws, literally, or toothpicks, literally, to uh -huh. figure out who drew which of those two chicken dishes. And then everybody gets about two hours to, to make a meal for one, starch, vegetable, protein, sauce, and garnish. Those five elements presented for one tasting bite from me and a critique, and then the rest of the dinner, the rest of the plate is yours to enjoy. And that's, uh, that's how the course is evaluated or how student success is evaluated. Good to know, good to know. I bet students want to know what topics they'll, they'll be learning about. Could you tell us a bit of that as well? So we start with knife skills and safety, and of course, uh, food safety and sanitation. The first half of the class is really focused on uh, fundamental cooking techniques. So saute, pan fry, deep fry, braising or combination cooking, roasting. There's a little bit of some basic uh, pastry or bake shop techniques worked in, in terms of things like pie dough, cookies, and uh, quick breads, and as well as a, a yeast bread. Uh, stocks and sauces, we hit on some of the very introductory fundamentals of the garmage kitchen. Garmage is one of those French terms that basically refers to the, the cold kitchen or the part of the kitchen that's responsible for things like cheese making, charcuterie, salads, uh, contemporary kitchens will oftentimes have the garmage kitchen responsible for plating desserts. Uh, working with fruits, vegetables, potatoes, and grains, we spend a whole class session on breakfast, one of my favorites. Uh, that virtual class focuses on menu planning and nutrition. We talk about poultry and radites, and if you're not familiar with what a radite is, think of something like an ostrich or an emu, those are rat eyes. Uh, veal, beef and bison, fish and shellfish, we touch on that a couple of times, pork, we get a delicious North African lamb dish. And uh, the one class that's of the, of the 21 face-to-face -face classes, we have one that is uh, purely classroom at the end, and that's on cost control techniques. Thank you so much, Seth Rich. I think this really gives students a great overview of, of what the course is going to look like. Um, we have just a couple of additional program requirements, and if it's okay, I'll just I'll go Absolutely. over these. Yeah. Um, um, myself or my team work on these, and so um, they're, they're requirements that are part of uh, the program after you register. So you will submit to a background check um, as part of the program. You are representing KSU um, when you are going into these restaurants um, throughout the city. Um, and we want to make sure that um, you are a good representation of the program that we're offering. So background checks are conducted, waivers of liability are signed. Proof of in health insurance is always um, something that a lot of students have a question about. Um, we do ask that you have health insurance. Um, um, Chef Rich mentioned earlier, kitchens can be a bit dangerous at times. You know, right. we're, we're learning knife skills. We're, we're boiling hot water. You know, we're doing so many things that um, you need to be cautious about. And so we do ask that you have health insurance um, to be a part of the program. That has to um, be in place before our first class. Um, we definitely um, could not send you to one of the apprenticeship sites uh, until that has been completed. So we ask just to make sure that you are um, providing that information to us by the time your first in-person class occurs. Drug testing is also something that um, in the past, um, we did have students participate in a test or drug test. Um, we do not do that any longer. That is not part of our registration process, but students do agree 
um, and you must agree to this, um, that you will submit to a drug test at any of the sites, the apprenticeship sites. Um, not all of them require it, um, many of them do not. Um, but again, uh, kitchens can be dangerous. Um, so we wanna make sure that you are safely working in those locations. So if one of the apprenticeship uh, sites requested that you um, conduct, have a drug test conducted, um, we would ask that you adhere to that. And so all of those forms are things that you fill out prior to the class starting. So after you register, um, we have you come in for your fitting for your chef's jacket, and we help you through your paperwork that needs to happen before class starts. So, so those are some of those program requirements we need to add um, to our list there. So hopefully all of those have been extremely helpful to um, be able to let you know as a potential participant um, what the class is going to look like once you start. I also would like to introduce you to Deshaun Johnson. Deshaun actually, as of today, has just successfully completed the culinary apprenticeship program. So he is part of our current program. Um, so Deshaun, I wanna ask you just a few questions if I may. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, tell me what, uh, now that you have successfully finished this program, what was your biggest takeaway from the, from the program this time? Um, I would probably say just being at the apprenticeship sites for me, um, having that hands-on experience. Um, it's one thing when you're in class and you're learning knife skills, you're learning recipes, but it's a, a whole different animal uh, to be actually in the restaurant uh, do, you know, and partaking in those uh, recipes and doing the knife skills and everything. So for me, uh, having the opportunity to go from you know apprenticeship site to apprenticeship site uh, was kind of the most exciting and biggest takeaway for me. Wonderful, thank you, thank you. So was that the highlight of the program or what can you really, what's what ex most exciting thing occurred in the program or something that you learned probably that you were not aware you were going to be learning? What was that? Um, I, I would say that for me, the, the biggest highlight uh, was just working on the line. That's not something that I expected coming into the program, um, but being able to work on the line at uh, two of the apprenticeship sites, uh, when there's customers coming in or orders are coming in and having to make it, uh, for me, that was the most exciting thing because um, I just like being in that environment. Uh, so yeah, that, that's probably something I'd never expected uh, going into it. Great, great. So why did you choose the KSU program when you were looking for a culinary program? Uh, well, the, to, to be honest, uh, the, the biggest reason was uh, my dad, who's also a chef, he actually attended the KSU culinary program uh, a few years ago. Um, and that's kind of what gave me my inspiration to actually go ahead and pursue it. Um, it was something I always loved doing, but I didn't think it was something that was realistic. Uh, but when my dad actually did it, uh, I took a, uh, took a step back and I looked and I said, this is something I can actually do. Uh, so that's what kind of brought me into it. Absolutely. You shared that story with Chef Rich and I just the other day, and I think that's absolutely wonderful that yeah. you were a legacy for the program. That's so impressive. Yeah. So. Um, now, are you planning to work in the field as well? Uh, yes, I am. Uh, I currently got a, a job offer from uh, one of the apprenticeship sites for Atlanta Country Club. So uh, that is the, the, the place that I want to start work, or that I've already currently started working at, uh, but that I want to kind of go forward in the future with. Congratulations for that. So that is so absolutely wonderful to be able to finish a program and already have a position that you're, mm -hmm. you're working on. Congratulations. Any experiences that you want to share? Any any other information about the program that you would think would be helpful for prospective students? Um, I would probably say going into it um, or just really coming out of it, you get uh, out what you put in. Uh, one of the biggest things I learned, uh, especially being in the apprenticeship site, they can tell how much you're engaged and how much work you're actually putting in. And if you show that you have that initiative and drive uh, and the willingness to learn, uh, they will continue to move you through and put you in those positions to learn more and more. And every single location I've been in, um, I did start off as kind of doing the prep, uh, but because I was executing that well, then it was okay, hey, come help us out with banquet or hey, you can move to the line, help us out with that. Uh, so that was pretty fun kind of experiencing. Um, and same thing with like uh, at Canoes currently, I learned so much that uh, one of the guys who was gone for a day came back and I had to help him learn the sets. And then it got to the point where he was like, you know what, you got this, I'll shout at you. So I ended up doing that for a shift. That's wonderful. That is so wonderful. 
So thank you. And again, Deshaun, congratulations on completing thank the program. You. Such a such a tribute to yourself. So um, also I would love to um, to introduce to you Andy Long, who is um, from one of our apprenticeship sites. So Andy, how are you today? I'm doing well. All right, good, good. Can you tell us a little bit about your restaurants that you work with? Yeah, I'm the culinary director for Maven Restaurant Group, um, mostly based out of Alpharetta. Um, we have Lapeer Steak and Seafood, South Main Kitchen, and Butcher and Brew. Um, all three kitchens are from scratch kitchens. Um, we are, they're all helmed by a, a, a chef that, and a, and a team that's strong. You know, I work kind of with each team at each restaurant, kind of going back and forth. Um, we also have a full-time pastry chef that makes desserts for all the restaurants from scratch. And as well as we just started uh, producing uh, pastries as well as some savory items for a local coffee shop around the corner. Oh, that's wonderful. I don't even think I knew that. That's terrific. Yeah. That is wonderful. Well, thank you. So now, Andy, why did you decide to partner with KSU? This is your first year to be one of our apprenticeship sites. We've had a really good experience with the program so far. Um, we thought it, it would be, we hoped it would be a, a good opportunity to, you know, bring some students in that, you know, we're looking for people that have a passion for this as their career. Um, we know we have a great learning environment, really good people to learn from. Um, and we thought if we could get involved, we'd maybe meet some students that, you know, have that drive, you know, they, they want to get involved with it. And, you know, maybe not right now, but maybe down the line, we spark a little interest in them, you know, that they'd like to come back and work with us. Uh, you know, we're always, you know, we will, even though some students, they might not have the most experience to us, you know, the willingness and, and um, like I said, that drive to, to do it well and, and giving a hundred percent effort that's, that's, and reliability, that's more important to us so much than, um, knowledge and skill, you know, that kind of stuff can come with time. I understand that completely. So a question that we often have from our apprentices is how are the schedules decided? Like when, when they contact you, how do you determine their schedule they'll be working? We're pretty open. We're, we're really flexible. You know, we'll work with whatever schedule works for them. Most students have had some kind of other job and obviously the schoolwork, um, you know, so we do whatever we can to accommodate their schedule and the life that, that they've got, um, you know, and with three locations for us, it's, it's kind of easy to just depending on whatever they want to do, if they can really only work in the morning, we can figure out some morning shifts. If it's the only night thing, you know, we can figure that out as well. You know, sometimes I, I do encourage them if they can to, you know, yes, if they're, you know, like Deshaun said, you know, when he started everywhere, kind of starting that prep role um, and helping the prep cooks and that kind of thing. And that's what we do with all the students as well. But I really encourage them to get some of that nighttime line work, it's a whole different experience for them. Good, good. You touched on my next question, but um, what does a shift really look like for a student um, that would be coming to your restaurant? Yeah. Um, you know, we start them in the prep role and really kind of assess, you know, their skill set, life skills, um, time management, organization, speed, and, and we kind of go from there. And, you know, as they learn, you know, they might spend a, a week or two weeks kind of just doing that. And we really see, you know, where they're at um, experience wise. And then as they grow and get a little more comfortable, you know, in our environment, then we just slowly try to, you know, add a little bit to their plate and show them more. We, you know, we encourage them to try to get
get to the line if it's at nighttime and and see what's going on with service. Um, you know, we've had a number of students that really take initiative to just kind of jump in and and try to help with whatever they can, which is which is great. You know, so those shifts are you know they range from all over the all over the kitchen for us. Great, great. Um, and I think that the participants in this information session would love to hear, um, again, um, you mentioned it on why you partnered with KSU, but would you consider hiring one of the apprenticeship students if you built a relationship with them and saw their skill set? We definitely would. We, we've actually, we've hired one student so far, um, and he really showed a lot of interest in our, our pastry program with Chef Elise. And... You know, when we took on the uh, the production with the coffee shop, it we really needed some extra hands, you know, to take care of desserts for three restaurants as well as all that production. And so, um, you know, he didn't have a ton of experience, but he's really he loves it. He showed a ton of interest. He's reliable, and you know, we wanted to give him the opportunity. And we know with time, you know, he's going to be a really great asset for us you know, as well as him, you know, coming in and having fun and, and learning new things. And, um, you know, that's the one student that we've hired and we'd totally be open to hiring other students. You know, we've really seen some some students with really good skill set and, you know, their head on their shoulders. Good. Thank you so much, Andy. And I, I want to say thank you for all that you do for our students. So thanks for being with us today. You're welcome. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to have the opportunity to also hear from our registration uh, manager and also um, our pathway advising director. So uh, Ryan Caps is going to join us first. Um, he is the manager of registration. How are you today, Ryan? Doing well. How are you? Just terrific. Thank you. Thank you. I have actually several questions for you because I think as people join these information sessions, registration is something they have a lot of questions about. How do I get financial aid or what what are the payment plans look like how do I go about registering so so I'm going to ask you a few things that I think will be helpful to our potential students yeah. so could you first of all kind of introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself yeah absolutely um, so I'm, I'm the uh, manager of registration uh, like Pat said I've been in higher education for about 16 years now uh, with uh, 15 of those uh, in financial aid uh, so uh, a lot of experience with that um, I've been here with KSU for about eight months now, um, but I really enjoy it and uh, uh, looking forward to working with everyone. Good. Awesome. And we enjoy working with you, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell us some of the financial aid options that are available for our culinary apprenticeship um, program yeah. here? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we do offer payment plans. Uh, which we'll get into here uh, in a little bit. Uh, we accept VA education benefits uh, as well as student loans. Okay, terrific. Now you mentioned payment plans. So how do those work? Yeah, so the payment plan is broken up into six payments. Uh, the first of which would be due at the time of registration. Uh, it is $2,500, so $2,500. Uh, the remaining amount is spread over the other five payments. Um, so uh, they range uh, depending on when you register, um, anywhere from uh, uh, twelve ninety nine to fourteen ninety nine, so one thousand two ninety nine to one thousand four ninety nine, depending on when you register. Awesome. Now, what about the process for students that potentially have military benefits? Yeah. So for those students, uh, there is a, a, a form on our website, which is cpe.kennesaw.edu, called the VA Information Form. Uh, the first step would be to fill that out and submit that. That lets us know that you want to use your VA education benefits and which chapter uh, you plan on using. Uh, we ask you to submit in along with your certificate of eligibility. And if you are using the Post 11 GI Bill, we also ask for your DD-214. Once we have all of that, uh, we can then check your eligibility um, and, and get you registered and get you set up with those benefits. Sounds great. Thank you. Thank you. Now, what about employer vouchers? I know we have a, a lot of employers that actually pay for the course. So what does that process look like? Yeah. So if your employer is uh, willing to help you pay for the course, that is wonderful. Um, what they would do is they would give you a, a voucher, essentially stating to us that they are going to be paying for the course. Um, once we have that, 
uh, we can then invoice them uh, for payment for the course. We get you registered, we invoice them for the payment, and we're gonna work with them to get uh, the cost of your, your course all covered. Wonderful. Now, what about discounts for KSU students or faculty members, staff members? How do they apply those or any discount for alumni potentially? Yeah. For KSU? Yeah, so we do offer uh, discounts for, for all of those. So um, for those, if you do fall in, in one of those buckets, uh, you can give us a call. Uh, we just need to verify that you are indeed a, a student or a alumni uh, or, or employee. Uh, once we verify that, we get the discount applied. Uh, so if you are uh, a, a current KSU student, staff or faculty member, um, it is a $1,000 discount off the culinary program. Um, for an alumni, uh, it is a 10% discount, um, which comes out to be $995. So, um, uh, so right around a thousand for, for those. So if you are, give us a call, we can get that, uh, that applied for you. Awesome. Thank you. Now, what kind of application process is it for our professional education program? Yeah. So, uh, most of our, our programs, uh, uh, do not require any sort of application. Uh, it is open uh, to everyone in, in the area. Um, there are some other programs that do require it, such as in the healthcare uh, field, but for this particular program, uh, there is not any sort of application that is, that is required. Okay, okay, good. What about a refund policy? Yeah, so a refund policy is uh, if you register and then decide that uh, you, you wish to not attend anymore, um, you do need to cancel the enrollment three or more business days prior to the start of class to get a full refund. Um, uh, one to two days prior, you receive an 80% refund. And then once the class starts, there is no, no refund offered. Um, I will say a little caveat with that is if you do the payment plan, $500 of that $2,500 first payment is non-refundable, regardless of the time frame. But uh, if you if you did pay in full, it would be a 100% a refund to three or more business days before the class starts. Okay. Now, what happens if the class did cancel? Yeah, so if the class is canceled, uh, you would get a full refund, um, regardless of if you paid in full or had a payment plan or anything like that. Um, we do also give you the option to transfer to an equivalent course. Um, so like Pat said, we do have, uh, we do run run this course a couple times a year. Uh, so if the next offering is something you were interested in, we would be able to, to move you to that next one uh, if you wish to do that. Okay. Well, for those that are, are ready to sign up, is there a deadline for registration? Do, do they have time for this or, or what's our um, registration and application deadline? Yeah. So five days before the class starts uh, it would be the deadline. Um, I always encourage students not to wait that long uh, because with courses, especially with this one, uh, there is only a finite amount of seats um, to be had. Uh, so uh, if once the class fills up, um, you know, they may not be able to get in. So we do, do encourage every student to, to not wait. Uh, but as long as there are seats available five days before uh, class starts uh, is what uh, the deadline would be. Okay, good. Now, what's the process for registering? Yeah. So uh, we have a couple different options that you can do. You can go under a website that I mentioned, CPE dot kennesaw dot edu uh, create a profile register and pay uh, right on the website uh, if you need assistance you can give us a call uh, we can help you out over the phone um, the phone number is 470-578-6765 option one uh, we can uh, take you over the phone like i mentioned before if you're going to be using any sort of financial aid you can give us a call and we can get you, get you set up with that um, or if you wanted to pay in person with cash or check, uh, you can do that too. You can come to the KSU Center. Um, just give us a call once you get here and we can come out and, and get you all set. Okay, good. You mentioned online and, and in person. What about faxing um, in a registration or mailing that in? Is that something that's possible? It is, yes. Um, so we, you can do fax or mail. Um, there is a registration form on our website, uh, cpe.kennesaw.edu. Um, you would want to uh, print out the registration form, fill it out with all your information, uh, the course that you want, the form of payment, you can put a card information on there, you can attach a check, um, things like that. Um, uh, so you can send that, that in by mail if you're sending a check. Um, the, web, uh, the uh, address is the KSU College of Professional Education 
at 3333 Buskey Drive, number 3301, Kennesaw, Georgia, 30144. Or if you wanted to uh, fax it in, we can accept the credit card information via fax. You can send it to 470-578-9085. Perfect. Now, you mentioned all these different ways to register, which is terrific to let everyone know how that is. So what happens after you register? What, what um, will occur at that point? Yeah, so once you're registered, once we complete the process, uh, the first thing is you will receive uh, a registration confirmation email. Uh, as long as well as a uh, payment confirmation receipt as well, depending on, on how, how you're covering the course. Um, you'll, so you'll receive that right away. Um, on the website, you will have uh, information about the books and supplies that you need. So we always have kind of um, information about that. Uh, also too, as it gets a little bit closer, you will receive information from the program manager, uh, kind of welcoming you to the program, uh, giving you more information about where you need to go, what you need to do, things like that. So uh, there will be uh, kind of periodic uh, information coming your way once you do register. Okay, good. Now, once you complete the program successfully, how do you get a transcript for the program? Yeah, so um, there is a, a request form uh, on our website. Uh, so again, cpe.kennesaw.edu. Uh, when you go to the student resources section, uh, there's a frequently asked questions uh, section is underneath that. Uh, and uh, it's section, subsection 2.1 uh, is the transcript request form. Uh, so you can fill that out. Um, that comes right, right to our office and we get that process and sent out to you. Right. Thank you so much, Ryan. Um, I have to say Ryan's team is always available to help if you have questions or need help with registration. So thanks for being here and for what you're doing for our, our program, Ryan. I appreciate it. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Now on to the core of the program. I know you guys joined us for wanting some details. And so um, we'll let Xiao Xiao say hello um, at the end of our, our time. Xiao Xiao, would you like to say hello? Xiao Xiao is our sure. director. Yeah, absolutely. So everybody, hi, uh, welcome. And my name is Xiao Xiao Ji. I'm the director of the professional enrollment management. And one of the team that we're having here is called Pathway Advising, um, as Pat mentioned before. So Pathway Advisors are here to provide advising sessions for our students and alumni to discuss the most current local data on wages, industry growth, and job postings. And we can also provide you with the information on the top employers, as well as the most requested skills, so that students can be sure their resume is aligned with what is being requested by the employer in our area. And a lot of students actually ask us questions. So do we offer job placement programs after they learn this program, right? Um, I want to say we do not offer job placement programs. However, we provide a wide range of career development resources for our students. It can be very helpful as students begin their job search to understand the local data on wages, industry growth, as well as the recent job postings and top requested skills and top employers. And on top of that, I would like to highlight, we do have two different resources that is very uh, helpful for our culinary students and also alumni. So first one is our Facebook group, Job Posting. Um, so this is called Career Development Facebook Group. And this is an online platform for our CPE students and alumni to find job postings with opening positions or internships that's shared through our potential employers who reach out and looking for culinary students or internships. So we share these opportunities through Facebook group and one student enrolled, fully enrolled into our program, they are eligible to request and then we will be able to have you join this group. And then another one is called Handshake. That one is uh, after you graduate from our uh, certificate program and you are eligible to request a Handshake account. And Handshake, Handshake is an all-in-one platform that will provide student job postings and also will re, uh, give you more information about how to revise your resume, cover letter, all those information. 
So um, our advising team here also provide you the advising sessions. So I would encourage our students to reach out to our advising team first if you have any questions about the course, including you know the cost of the course, the information about the course, and every information. So we are here and we would like to help. Thank you, Xiao Xiao. That is a huge bonus for all of our students. So thank you for you, what you and your team are doing to help people find positions and help them make enrollment decisions. So thank you very much. Thank you everyone for joining us. Um, uh, so if you do have any questions about the program itself, feel free to reach out to our Pathway Advising at pathwayadvising at kennesaw.edu. And you may feel free to set up advising sessions with our advisors and to seek more information on data, wages, industry information. And if you do have questions about financial aid, particular for payment plans, military benefits, or education loans, feel free to reach out to our financial aid team, which is CE Financial Aid at kennesaw.edu. And if you have difficulties register online, and feel free to reach out to our registration office at CEREG at kennesaw.edu, or just call the number 470-578. 6765, option number one. Xiao Xiao, I think we have some questions already. If it's okay, Chef Rich and I will try to go through those and answer those for those that are participating. Sure. Awesome. Um, the first question that I see here is, is this an in-person class? And I think that you you discussed that oh, yeah. rather well. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, again, and just a, a, a career of experience, right? So the, the instruction method is definitely in person for the majority of it, all except for one classes we meet face to face. What's the classroom size? How large would the class be? Uh, we're comfortable with 10. We have 10 people in the classroom, which uh, gives everybody enough uh, opportunity to use the space, and that's the right number for the amount of kitchen equipment that we have, burners on the stove, that sort of thing. Perfect, perfect. Um, this happens often, but this is a great question somebody has. Could they come in for an in-person tour? And I'll be glad to answer that because sure. I get the opportunity to do that. Now, I sometimes interrupt Chef Rich during his class to show people around, um, but I love that opportunity to let you come in and see the building that we're at. We're at the KSU Center. Um, so free parking is one of our best things that we sell for, the, for our location here. We're across the street from main campus. And so you can park here come in and I will be glad anytime to schedule uh, a kitchen tour. You can see where your class will actually be occurring. So I, I would recommend that at any time. So um, Chef Rich, um, when um, do the apprenticeships start? Uh, we want everybody to start their apprenticeships after they have attempted the CERF safe exam. Hopefully okay. pass the exam, right? Yeah. So somewhere around week three or four into the program. Okay. Um, what are the age range of most of the students in the program? I would say most of our students are probably late 20s, early 30s, okay. uh, but fresh from high school, like newly minted high school graduates, probably 18, 19 have okay. been in the class, and we've had some that are second career retirees that are probably, you know, I never asked, but my hunch is they're probably 60-ish, close to, somewhere around there, so... Um, wide span of ages. Wide, like, wide yeah. span of yeah. ages. I know I personally had two students in other classes that were on the footsteps of 70. So it's, wow. it's a wide range that I've worked with. Yeah. Everybody has a bucket list, you know, yeah. and got to complete it. So. Um, so what types of jobs do students usually um, move into after this program? So the beauty about the field of food service culinary arts and working as a chef is the opportunities to go into any into so many different types of food service are out there uh, if there's a, uh, a high volume big restaurant in atlanta that you've always enjoyed and would love to work at that could be an opportunity for you if it's something that's a little bit more uh well measured and paced like catering operations can be you know catering you always know who your guests are you have a really good idea of what you're making and how many people are coming. 
much more predictable than say a typical uh, restaurant concept. That can be an option that people pursue. Uh, one thing that really came to light as a consequence of the COVID pandemic is that some of the institutional food service operations, like working in uh, elderly care or even university environments, there are still customers that need to be fed. And those are people who did not lose their jobs as a result of the economy contracting. So I see students going in a lot of different directions. Good. Um, you mentioned students could not miss more than four classes, but it sounds like every class is really busy and you're learning new skills. What happens if you miss a class? Well, if you miss a class, um, we can certainly talk about what you've missed. The food that was there for that night has probably been cooked right. and eaten by yeah. everybody <laughs> else who was there. Right. I can tell you there's never left a leftover steak on the night when we missed <laughs> steak. I can imagine. That. Um, um, and because of the way the I have the course designed, there's, there's so much rechecking through the mm -hmm. in-class assessments that it can become kind of the snowball effect that it was an absence for the missed lesson. And then it can also have an impact on a future assessment that you weren't prepared for. So it's really, really important to think long and hard about missing anything. We only meet once a week. It's, it's a, you know, I, I respect the time that people have set aside for this. So I want to make sure that I'm giving people the value that they expect. And I think this is a, I've always viewed it as a partnership between the, the adult students who take on a continuing education type program. And I think that everybody should get their money's worth and their education will fit from that. Good. Do prospective students need cooking skills already before they apply for the program? No. I mean, the short answer is no. If you have it, great, but the apprenticeship experience is going to bring that knowledge to you, that experience of working in the kitchen. I'll say that people who have some experience might accelerate faster. Sure. Um, but everybody starts from someplace, and that should a lack of experience shouldn't be a reason not to consider the program. Now, when do students, those the list of things that they would purchase outside the program, the shoes, the knives, the, those types of things, when do they need those items? Uh, by the second or third week. Okay. Right? Okay. So you don't need it the first week because we're going over all of the housekeeping details and we dive headfirst into the Serve Safe Manager course material. Uh, we're in the kitchen a little bit, but nothing uh, in any scale that is very dangerous. But by the time we get to that third week and your opportunity then to go on into the industry uh, to start working on your apprenticeship hours, you really need to have those chef pants, those non-slip shoes. An apron's a really good idea, something to put on your head. Maybe it's a KSU baseball cap or something like that. Um, and then the, the knives are, are really important. And if you want to come check out a couple of knives before you commit, that's a good idea. Everybody's hands are different. and responds to different knives differently. I would just say you don't have to spend a fortune on a knife to get a good quality knife. And you probably don't want to buy a really expensive knife to take on your work experiences while you're learning. Um, the next is a, a question that I haven't really thought about before. It's a great question. Um, how do you deal with allergies? If you're someone that has a passion for this program or cooking, but you have allergies. So I've had students with various kinds of uh, either uh, either allergies, food aversions, or maybe for personal or religious reasons, don't want to touch, handle, or eat different types of food. And I asked that question the first night and then also communicated it's really important to the student to be diligent and protect him or herself. Uh, let me know. Nobody's required to touch anything that, you know, could cause them harm or is something that they're, uh, for whatever reasons, don't want to work with. But at the same time, you have to uh, protect yourself so make sure that you're aware. Uh, we do handle seafood a couple of times, and I, I'm on, I know that there are some people who can't be within a mile of it. Right. Other people uh, can be in the room, they just can't touch it. Some people can touch it, they just can't eat it. So I don't treat allergies or food aversions as a one-size-fits-all. It's a dialogue between me and the student to figure out what the best solution is, and then ultimately for the student to be mindful of what they have to do to protect, to protect themselves. 
Absolutely. Um, final question, um, it looks like that came in. Uh, what are the preparations before uh, students begin the apprenticeship? Well, a good night's sleep is always a good way yeah, to start. That's a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, reaching out to those apprenticeship sites, so if it's Maven Group, if Chef Andy or one of the contacts with them, to talk about what your availability is and figure out what their needs are. I'll point out that things like um, some of the institutional food operations, like a dining hall here at a university campus, you know, it gets pretty slow during the Christmas break. Yes, and yeah. that's not the same case for some of the restaurants that might be doing catering for holiday parties. So you have to kind of keep in mind where you're assigned and what their needs are. Uh, so that, you know, it's, it's a conversation between the two of them and it's up to the student and that apprenticeship site to work that out. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you all so very much.